You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Rowlands and I'm joined once again by John Townley. And today we're going to do a and a It's been absolutely ages since we've done one of these, or so it feels like for me anyway. Uh, John, how are you? How's things? Yeah, fine, thanks, mate. Yeah, a good good midweek because it's obviously Villa one of the weekend. It's not just the weekend, is it, that you can kind of get that boost. It's throughout the whole week. It lasts for the whole week, yeah. And we've obviously got Palace at home on the weekend as well, so that's something to um, look forward to, hopefully. Maybe Mm. we uh, (laughs) get into the top half by next week. (sighs) What a joy that would be to get into the top half at last. I said on our post much earlier the other day to still be stuck in 11th. I know we've lost a few games, but it's so irritating. Just get us in the top half. People watching this will be able to see or might notice I've moved house. <laughs> Had a baby, moved house. Uh, now starting to add more things into the podcast. I don't do things by halves. I try and make myself as super busy as possible. I uh, have a bit of a work in progress with the background and stuff. I don't want to get a shirt on the wall or something up here, but it looks all right. I know we've been talking off camera about your background, John. You want to do some bits as well because it does feel weird, doesn't it? Just sat in front of a blank wall. Yeah, it's a really poor background. The only other background I used to have was like when the sun was coming through my window, so it just didn't make for good viewing. But hopefully I might be moving out in a couple of months as well, so I'll like fully invest in a new villa wall or all, all that sort of thing. You know, make it look a bit more professional than literally like a blank wall. It's very boring, but it's better than that and like the sun coming through on my camera like all the time so i mean i mean ultimately the background is absolutely irrelevant isn't it as long as the content is good but it's something to look at if uh, people are sick of seeing our faces it's a little print back there for the for the eagle eye as well but all of this will change at some point once i settle in q a time then i did a tweet uh on the 28th what day was that uh tuesday and had a few replies some football related some things some nonsense ones of course as always with the current blue audience i've not looked at them since i did the tweet so these will be in no particular order but we will go through as many of them if not all of them if we can so first of all john from on the terraces who realistically will be the next academy player to get a run in the first team i think that's probably it's a two-part question isn't it because you've got which academy players are most likely to do it. Mm. But then <laughs> the part of getting a run in the team, I think, is actually That's much more so difficult. Exactly that. And if you ask me if any of them are going to do it, I'd say um, no. <laughs> and it sounds a bit depressing, but who, who's most ready at the moment? You'd say it was either Cameron Archer or Tim uh, Irib- mm. Dune from QPR. I'd probably say Tim because I think he's had a full season now, hasn't he, of uh, championship football, or he will have. I think he's played like... 25 games, only missed two of the games he could have played for QPR this season. First so he's still in the weekend as well. Yeah, first professional goal as well the weekend. Mm. Which is good. So he seems ready to step up to make you know his Premier League. Oh, he's made his Premier League debut actually, hasn't he? But play a, you know a few more games. But at what point does Unai Emery say, "Okay, I'm going to take out Douglas Louise or I'm going to take Bubba Kamara out to play a 19, 20 year old?" Mm. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's unlikely and the same goes for Cameron Archer and um, we'll probably speak about him later on but he's not going to be getting above Watkins who rarely misses games and a new strike is probably going to come in in the summer as well so at what point do you you know do you give these players for opportunities it's very difficult and it's not really a I say it's, it, it is Unai Emery's job to promote youth of course it is but it's also his job to get us into Europe and mm-hmm. win us trophies and those are the ambitions of the club and their um kind of like here and now sort of thing. We're not a, a Brighton, should we say, and you can afford to slip down to 13th one season and 14th and then have a good season one, you know, because you've brought through players. We don't really have the luxury of doing that. It's kind of a here and now success plan. Yeah. And obviously we're investing loads into the youth aspects, but that's because we want to be a sustainable club because this isn't just a five-year plan. It's a, you know, a forever plan, I suppose you'd call it. So yeah, Kessler Hayden, Tim Archer, those are probably the three at the moment. They've you know come out of the academy and look ready, but getting game time is another sort of debate altogether. Yeah, Kane Kester was the one I was going to shout at you here because there's a question from Ant Walsh, which leads perfectly on. Really, he said, "Do you see Matty Cash at Villa next season?" Ash Young's obviously been playing a lot over Cash. Cash played at the weekend and played well, I thought. But you do kind of have these thoughts that maybe he isn't this kind of certified player because at one point you kind of go Watkins, Martinez, Dulcuiz, Cash is almost you know, a, not a, um, a spine of the team but kind of names that will probably be there for three or four years as we go through this project but then you think mm, maybe that is a place you can upgrade and Matty Cash doesn't have a long term future. You're looking at the right back position it's a question marks over both players because one Ashley yeah. Young I don't know if he's going to be here next year I'd like him to be and I'm sure Emery does as well but whether that's going to happen or not we don't know yet that's um, I suppose unclear that'll probably come down to the last few 
uh, weeks of the season, probably, you know, sort of National Young's future out because we don't know what's going to happen with, you know, potentially upgrading in that position. For me, I think Matty Cash, I've said it for a long time, and he's probably his, his own, you know, critic in this department, but it's his it's his final ball for me. It's his, it's his quality in the mm. final third. I, I did some digging on his stats from last season. And defensively, he posted some really good numbers. He was sixth for most tap, sorry, sixth for the most dribblers tackled across any of the, you know, the Premier League player last year. Seventh most blocks, sixth most tackles, and then seven mo seven mo sorry, seventh most tackles one. I can't get my words out to me numbers. <laughs> um but then going forward, he had the seventh most crosses into the box of all Premier League players, yet he's got what is it? What what, what did he have last year? Like four, four assists maybe. I think it was four assists in forty eight games, which is from the start of last season. Only mm. four assists. So that's it's hardly productive, is it? Six assists in 76 games in a Villa show in the Premier League and it's not enough. And I think defensively, it, it, it's okay. Like Cash can do that job. And as I said, his numbers that he posted last year were really good. Like I was kind of you know, pleasantly surprised by them. But you want... And, and the thing is, he can do what Emery wants in terms of galloping forward, getting to the byline and being athletic and energetic like Alex Moreno is on the other side. Mm. But the quality... I say I don't want to say he doesn't have it, but he hasn't shown it. You know, you can't lie with the uh, with the numbers. And a few times, you know, you look. I always go back to that Brighton game, and when uh, I don't know if you remember when Danny Ings scored. I think it was our second goal. I think it was. Um, he gets to the byline cash, and he whips the ball in for Buendia, and it was on his head, and he hits the post. But it was a simple kind of like ball across the box, and it was just mm. you know on the floor, and it was in his. Uh, it would have been a tapping. So. In, in like in those moments, if you get one moment in a game, Cash needs to make sure it's the right ball and the right delivery. And I think a bit often he struggles to make the right choices or the wrong deliveries um, is put into the box. So he needs to work on that. And he's obviously got a long time to do that. I say a long time. He's got until the end of the season to do that, really. But yeah, defensively, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with Cash, sorry. But then going forward, I think that's just the key number there is his ads. Yeah. A lot of crosses into the box, which is fine. Good. You know, he can do that, get, get into the byline and what. Emery wants, but the final ball is often sort of um, lacking and judging by the player that he's recruited in Alex Moreno, who we know can do that and put a quality ball in. I think that's obviously what he wants from the right back too. And I say Cash can do it, but he hasn't shown that he's got the final ball um, at least yet. Question from Stephen Deakin. He did a two-part one, but the second one requires a little bit of thought that I've not been able to do. First part, are we seeing the worst season ever of referees? I don't really like too much referee chat, so we'll move swiftly on from that in a second. The second one, after the mix-up of the Ramsey brothers and Buendia and McGinn from BBC, which two players' names would you mix together to make a new player? Serious or humour value? And I, I, I've been going through the squad list trying to think of a funny name between two players, but I can't. So unless you can think of one on the spot, we're going to have to wipe through that. Put it out to the comments, actually. If anyone with a bit more brain power than you can think of something put it in the comments below that's the first one though worst season ever of referees it does seem to be a lot of mistakes this is a not just a villa thing across the league as a whole lots of var interventions neil swarbrick the, the kind of head of var retiring at the end of the season which is apparently coincidental to any criticism lee mason obviously difficulties with i think he missed the game didn't he or something because of his var calls yeah referees crap said it for a long time standard refereeing across across england as a whole is terrible and needs to be better to match the, the quality of the, the football that we're supposedly seeing. Yeah, I'll be honest. I think the refereeing since we've been promoted, because I don't remember what it was like when we were, you know, pre-championship. This first season when we came up, and it was, I think that was the first year of VAR actually. And I was, yeah. um, I'm really sad. I, I made like a list of every decision that was really, really? just, and it took me only about a one, one month to like produce and I come up with like 70 or 80 things that were just I didn't understand um and I stopped after things so it's already like too long of a list um this season you could probably do the same yeah I, honestly I think it's just every season you're going to get mistakes and VAR should help that but it almost just exposes the mistakes mm, in a way yeah. because you've always got the excuse of oh but it's you know in real time you know you try being a referee that sort of thing but once you've got VAR and you can slow it down and whatnot then there's kind of no excuse and but then even when they do slow it down and they like go into like certain contacts and tackles and it's like well yeah because the game's played at like a million miles an hour you, you can't slow things down just because he's caught his like his ankle or something because it's stood like I don't know yeah decisions there's probably loads to go out and too many to discuss right now but I think it's probably you could argue it's the worst year for refereeing yeah um 
what do you think of AI Dan? Because I'm all for it, but it's just I can't understand how. And again, they they do it professionally, so there's clearly something. But I don't understand how you can sit in a booth and you are the only one who can come to a certain decision, and then everyone else on social media across the stadium, whoever you're supporting, whether you're their team or the other team, and you have a completely different outlook on what the one referee is doing in that booth. I don't mm. understand that part. And then there's probably loads of examples to go at. But yeah, what do you think? I just don't like it, full stop. I understand it. I, I, when you talk about like goal line technology and things like that, and it's just a split second thing, it's either in or out, and it's you know, sub, it isn't subjective whether a ball has crossed the line. I, I think technology is good for things like that. When you have to apply the subjectivity and common sense and context to you know split second decisions or contact, there's so many times you think, well, flip a coin and you could give that the other way and years gone by without intervention from technology it just depends on the referee on the day some would give it some don't you know you're going to get things go for you and some go against you I just don't like how like you said it brings kind of a spotlight to everything it's everything's magnified under the microscope and we're drawing lines on players and just don't like it sucks the fun out of it you either get to celebrate a goal twice or you celebrate a goal and have it ruled out things like that are just just so kind of detached from what football should be the whole thing just needs rework and i think is there a place for technology yes probably but in its current current implementation if the people are using it aren't up to standard it's not going to work is it it's always going to be a miss and the fact that this is supposed to be a quick fire q a and we spent 15 <laughs> minutes talking about var it says it all doesn't it yeah it, is, it proves we'll move on but it proves how sort of a yeah an annoying subject it is but also presumably how difficult it is to do because we are rubbishing it but at the same time there must be some reasons why these easy decisions seem easy but clearly aren't i don't know but yeah hopefully it gets better but i don't really know how let's move on quickly Connor wolf he says with emery sticking to play out the front the back brackets which is a good thing what's the three key positions we need to improve in the starting 11 next season that's probably a two-fold question, really. Those three players don't necessarily need to relate to playing out from the back, but a ball-playing defender, a new right-back potentially, whisper it quietly, a goalkeeper with better distribution. <sighs> Not for me. Ooh. Keep Martinez in there. Keep Martinez in there. I don't care about distribution. Martinez, absolutely keep him. Literally yeah. the best goalkeeper in the world. Let's not forget. Uh, three <laughs> positions to improve for you. I agree with two of them, yeah. Uh, I think... A right back, as I've mentioned before, with you know cash, we need competition there, in my opinion, whether Young stays or not, because I don't. I, again, you need for me, you need a long term. What who's long? Who is Emery's long term right back or right back options? One of them will probably be cash because you know you, you can keep him as a squad player or he can play every game if he uh, say improves on the stuff that I think that you need to do, but. I can see Emery signing a new right back, like he signed Moreno, a player that can um, contribute with assists and you know different actions going forward as well. And it's a cash to just play for him in the squad, and it's all about squad competition. So, yeah, right back potentially. I think a centre back could be on the list as well because if Callum Chambers departs, which is probably expected in the summer, then you're left with Mings, Concer, and Carlos. And although those are three good options. You probably need a fourth. Plus, we don't know where Carlos is going to, or sort of what, you know, or we don't know how the uh, injuries affected him, right? So, yeah. all I would say, though, is he probably that sort of injury, snapping your Achilles, could leave you out for like a year. And he's come back in about six months, nearly seven, I think. So, hopefully, the severity of it, although he's obviously snapped it, isn't as bad as sort of what, what it could have been. Yeah. So, hopefully, he'll come back and it'll be the sort of play that we signed. Um, but either way, I think a new centre back will probably be on the list because Emery, those none of those three players are his. He hasn't signed in those players, so I wouldn't be surprised if a centre back and a right back comes in. And then, I mean, that probably fixes the out of the back question. Obviously, we say Martinez's distribution can be improved every now and again, but I don't think it's like a major fault. And considering what he brings, no. to the anyway, it's you know um, a striker or at least someone who can just complement Watkins, whether that's a striker is a you know a classic number nine Benteke, you know, or a um, a winger like a Nico Williams I suppose that obviously been linked to so mm. anyone that can compliment Watkins I don't have the answer for who that is but um, obviously Emery will so we'll be bringing those in as well so that player um, someone that can compliment Watkins because obviously he's proven that he can do it for Emery someone that can bring the best out of him and the players around him you know kind of doesn't need to be a I don't know 50 million pound striker because I don't know who that would be anyway the striker market is is all over the place I said before mm. like Going to West Ham for like thirty. I don't even know if he's has he scored more than like twice. I don't know. Um, that Isaac oh, okay. went 
Newcastle for like 70 million. Yeah, he's a good player, but it's taken him time to adapt. So we need mm. someone who's a fit in the squad. It doesn't have to be a marquee signing necessarily. Someone who would work with Watkins and say the players around him. So yeah, uh, right back, a uh, central defender and a striker slash someone who can complement Watkins would be my sort of top three. Question from JT Aston V. So does Ash or anyone else on the pod, obviously it's not Ash or John for you, know what the club's pre-season plans are? I know they, they hold these things pretty close to their chest and are, are announced that, you know, once they're announced, you go, oh, that's where it is. Um, Portugal and Victoria, Vegas and the LV Villains, Australia again, or just Warsaw? Maybe a little bit of all of them. What do you think? Uh, we don't know yet, or at least I don't. I don't know if Ash does. I would yeah. presume it's he would have said by now if he did. It won't be long though until we do find out. It's usually around this time of year, isn't it? Yeah. It starts to come through, which is exciting. I would have thought Warsaw is the first one, and that's probably not as exciting as <laughs> the others that have been mentioned. I don't. I don't think obviously the Vegas villains one because the, the club hasn't been formed yet. Yeah. Uh, Victoria, you would have thought would be on the list. Surely, I'd be, I'd be amazed if there wasn't like a Kidderminster Shrewsbury double. Portugal for for ten days or something where we play Vitoria and maybe another couple of sides there in like a Portuguese Champions Cup tournament and then back here for Warsaw and maybe a home fixture against somebody like Napoli or something. That'd be oh, my guess. That'd be nice. If that's bang on, you'd say that clip. Um, <laughs> if that's bang on, everyone would be like, he knew what it was on March the first when they did that podcast. I said, well, don't. No, I'm only guessing. I mean, it um, wouldn't be Napoli, but it's like some obscure Italian side at Villa Park or something. Yeah, you would have thought we'd go further afield as well because that's what every Premier League club has to do nowadays for marketing etc uh, mm. we've done Australia was that last year Australia goodness yeah, me the summer just gone yeah yeah ages ago like yeah. a lot has changed she's like whoa um, I'd say last year it was like seven yeah. months ago yeah that's really like wow uh, yeah, yeah, manager then. that's what I mean that's what you're watching all of the mental um, Australia was last year and then we had COVID and stuff we obviously had Dubai as well a couple of months ago because of the break yeah. so you would have thought yeah. maybe uh, could be America uh, I don't uh, when was the last time we did uh, any part of Asia we did um, like 2013 was it yeah was it Lambert Lambert's time we went there we, yeah I remember playing well, that was that Hong Kong under 17 thing wasn't it when we when Lambert was still manager I don't know whether the oh, first usually, team went we there as a them. tournament yeah I'm pretty sure we did we had I remember Shay Gibbon wearing a keeper shirt out in China or something. I don't know why. Um, the Asian Cup was, it was always called. It's always played every year. I think we were in it. Anyway, yeah, I would have thought we would go out further field somewhere, whether that's America, Asia. I suppose those, that those are the kind of like the classic places, aren't they? Um, and then apart from that, maybe instead of going to France to play Rennes as we did in the summer last time, we'd maybe go to Vittoria or play. Hmm. It's quite close Vittoria to Braga and Port, uh, Porto as well. So, you can maybe set up a camp there for a week, I don't know, and then go and play a couple of teams there that are obviously at a very good level. Uh, so that's probably likely. But yeah, we don't know. Um, where would you like to see us play, Dan? Well, I don't I've, I don't care, to be honest. I mean, I'm not going to go I'm not going to go to any of the away games because that's not my thing. I'm not going to travel abroad or anything. I don't care. It's pre-season, isn't it? I want to see us play play some new players and win a couple of games, score some goals, where it is and who we play. Yeah, the, whole, the, whole pre-season, the whole pre-season stuff, and I know we do like a big pre-season podcast and whatever, but the talk is kind of like not irrelevant because we'd felt like the Steve and Gerrard stuff we were kind of bang on about. Like we were saying in pre-season, nothing's really changed mm. and nothing's really different, but we've won games, so it's great. And it's like, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah, honestly, it's... It's nice to look at the new kit. That's probably what. I'd say. Yeah. New kit, new players, score a few goals. Everyone has a couple of beers. Happy days. Uh, yes. You were bang on about about Hong Kong, by the way. Uh, Full time Blackburn Rovers nil. Aston Villa one. Uh, July twenty seventh, two thousand eleven. Uh, a goal from Darren Brent. <laughs> Given did play as well, so you're right about seeing Given in the show in Asia. So that was yeah. twelve years ago. Bizarre. How old are you then? Oh, Ten. Twelve. <laughs> I would have been twenty one. No, no, no. Sorry, eleven. Twenty one. <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> you know. uh, while we're having a, a laugh let's have a, a, a nonsense one from Villafan07 I assume he was born in 07 so he'd be what 15 or something Christ uh, what do you eat while watching a film at the cinema hot dog popcorn sweets etc now I can go and go with this one first I'm a big guy I know my food in and out no food at the cinema what just don't if I'm watching a film, I don't want to be crunching you on don't some have anything at the chocolate cinema. raisins or something. I, I used to have a bit of popcorn as a kid. But if I went now, I wouldn't have anything. Maybe a bit of chocolate, maybe. like a. Really? Know, just, I'm, I'm rusting bags and crunching on Maltese or something. Just, I want you to watch a film. Leave me alone. That's so boring. <laughs> that's who I am, mate. That's who I am. 
she, 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 you go to this. To be fair, it's very. I, mean, it's, I can't remember the last time I went to be honest. I probably was a child. Yeah, to be fair. Um, Pop, if I had to pick, if you said you've got to have something, I would pick popcorn. But besides yeah. that, people are like going in with like nachos and stuff. It's like, oh, yeah, give no, me a no, break, yeah. chomping nachos down my ear. I'm here to watch the new James Bond. Leave me alone. The first option was hot dog. I've never seen anyone go yeah. with a hot dog. Imagine getting a hot dog in the cinema. It would even be like proper meat. <laughs> Question from Oscar. He said, if you could sign any retired player who used to play for Villa to come in and improve the team now, who would you choose and why? A retired player. So I think we've had this question before and it'd be like a former player. So people, I remember I think somebody said Tammy Abraham once. People say things like Grealish, players like that. But a retired player, you've got to go back a few years for that. Martin Larson and Paul McGrath come in my mind straight away. But obviously, they had injury problems. I mean, if, if, they were in, if, if it was an option of injury-free or whatever, then yeah. <laughs> And one of one of those is you know go McGrath. I'll probably go post ninety well Premier League era because I'm not like too clued up with stuff pre two thousand to be honest. Um, <laughs> so too fair. Yeah, I, I would say if you could give me Ashley Young ten years ago in terms He's of not retired yet though, John. He's not retired was, yet. That was my favourite player. I don't know uh, Melberg to shore up the defence. I haven't got like yeah. a massive variety of players to pull from like James Milner still playing mm. uh, Young is still playing so I'd probably go Melberg but in- injury free I'd say Martin Larson No, I reckon Mike Suit being slightly more modern I people will be in the comments like Andy Gray Brian Little Sid Cow etc yeah they're all yeah, you know, awesome. an absolute given awesome. John Carew and Ollie Watkins I reckon that'd be a decent partnership you know yeah, it would Watkins be. isn't small but it's, it is a kind of big man little man to an extent Watkins is a pace yeah, Carew holding it up yeah, I love Carew. I, mean, I, I would not say no at all. The only thing I was going off was um, at the moment, if we had to do anything, I'd probably short the defence. But mm. if you have a big John Carew, then yeah, fine. <laughs> Go with it. Uh, a question from, oh, I don't think I'll pronounce this right, but it'll be on screen anyway. A raw Kader. Does anyone think that the club may listen to reasonable offers for Emiliano Martinez in the upcoming transfer window? Now, I'll split that in two questions for you. One, what would you deem a reasonable offer? And then two, just answer the question. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, please answer the question with what you think oh, a reasonable yeah. offer is. <laughs> reasonable offer for Martinez. I mean, reasonable is doesn't mean you have to accept it, but a reasonable yeah. offer would be what would you 50? think? I was going to say fifty. Yeah, I think the club aren't. I could, accepting... see, I could see a club offering fifty. Yeah, I don't think Villa would accept that though. I don't think Villa would accept lower than fifty, and would no. they consider something higher than fifty? Yeah, so. 50 million, I think, is probably the um, the benchmark. But to answer the second part, will they listen to offers? Every player has a price, and although clubs will insist that they don't or whatever, they do. Um, I don't know. I think it's one of those where he'll have suitors in the summer because there are a few clubs looking for goalkeepers. But at the but same time... they got the money, though. Exactly. So that's the point. It's <laughs> Villa are going to set £50 million plus for Martinez unless Chelsea or... United are hell bent on getting Martinez and they want him, then there might be discussion. But if it's a European club, I just, I don't know, like an Atletico Madrid, for example, I've always said, or I always thought maybe that he would end, end up there. His dad's come out in the media as well and said that he likes uh, Spain, he likes the weather in Spain. <laughs> you can't really Fair go. Enough. Yeah, I can't argue with that. Um, but then are they going to stump up 50 plus million? I don't know. Maybe if Oblak goes, I don't know if he would go for amount of money or unless he's a free transfer this summer. I'm not actually sure. How, and then again, you're looking at Martinez and thinking, well, for us, he's great and we're not going to you know, kind of uh, slate him at all, but the distribution is an element of his game that you can work on. If you're mm. a top side, you are going to have 70% of the ball most most of the time. So you need a keeper who can do everything. And you'd wonder if they would prefer to go for someone like a David Raya, for example, from um, Brentford, who's going to be quite cheap. I think his contract's coming up or going down, sorry. So, you know, there's not necessarily a... a um, what's the word? Uh, try not, what's the word? There's not a lot of keepers... That aren't available. That's a really way, bad way of saying. <laughs> there is a few keepers that are available. There we oh go. right. Um, and Martinez is just one of them. But obviously, there, mm. there are a couple of flaws in this game that top clubs would look at and perceive to be like genuine flaws. Whereas mm. we're like, oh, it's fine. We can get away with it. Um, so yeah, every player at this price, we would probably look to sell if we had to for sixty. Probably is what I would say. If I've got to be realistic for a sec, a serious as well as I would, I would suggest we've probably got. One more season out of Martinez, at least, and it, it's dependent on what is achievable next season. So let's say Villa get to the FA Cup final and finish eighth or seventh. 
you might be able to eke out another season out of him and go, right, well, we've gone from, say, 10th this year to 7th and a, an FA Cup final. Next year is the year we get into the top six or win a trophy. If next season is another table piddling around in mid-table, he, he's got every right to look, go to his agent and go, I oh, signed a deal to 2027. It's now 2024, would it be, I guess? The summer of 24. A couple of years left. Get me a move. I want to go to Arsenal. They've just won the league. Then the Champions League. I want to go back to Arsenal. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <it's actually happened. laughs> I forgot who played there before. Back to Arsenal. Forty million deal, and that kind of works out for all parties. If Villa go on to achieve what they want, and it's in line with that Martinez's ambitions, which is European football or silverware, there's no reason for him to leave. All, all the quotes I've seen, apart from the "I want to play in Champions League," is that he enjoys it here. He likes it here. He's valued. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, again, a bit like the referee chat. I don't want to give it too much credence because I don't think there's anything in, in it. Um, and we'll you know, kind of cross that bridge when it comes to it. But, yeah, I'd, I'd be... Obviously, I don't know anything, as I've said earlier. I'd be surprised if Martinez wasn't here next season unless somebody like a Chelsea come in with a stupid 100 million offer or something That's like something. that. The Villa have to go, OK, we could probably get David Ray, like you just said, for, for 30 and use the other 70 million to really improve the squad. But if someone comes in with 50-odd million... I don't see the point, to be honest. Um, we'll move on because there's still quite a few to get through. From Danny, who says, four weeks on from the end of the January window, some said we've been left short of options up front. Having seen Ollie Watkins back in form, in hindsight, were we right to cash in on Danny Ings? And what does it mean for Archer and Duran? Lots of love, Danny from Bedford. Yeah, I mean, like we said before, didn't we, in the, in the post-match show, I think the one I did about Ollie Watkins, I, I disappear for a few weeks and everyone's kind of going, oh, we could probably replace him at some point to now being a, yeah, he's the man, scored five and five. Let's go and get six and six, seven and seven, eight and eight, and score goals for fun. Um, so he's kind of like mini resurgence, I guess. What does that mean for for Archer and Duran going forward? Because Duran, Archer, Watkins is a three with possibly another chucked in there as well. Seems like a decent four options if Archer and Duran are kind of hitting the potential we expect them to. Yeah. And cashing in on Danny Ings, hindsight or not, was always the right decision. A player in the wrong, the wrong side of thirty, and we get most of our money back. That was a no-brainer, I think. To start with Danny Ings, yeah, I, we, I think we kind of most people agreed at the time. I think there was a kind of a, because Watkins hadn't been on a five, hadn't scored five goals in five before Ings was sold. There was almost the, oh, we're too short and Duran isn't ready and blah blah blah, which is fine. Um, but I think as as Emery said, we have like three or four months left of the season, maybe four or five, sorry, in January. But we we get by with that and Danny Ings will not cost £15 million next summer with 12 months on his deal and when he turns 31 I think it'd be or at least next season so it was the right decision from a financial point of view and as a footballing decision I backed it as well because he wasn't going to contribute as much I don't think um, mm. going forward you know for us when we needed to sort of rely on more so on Watkins and then a new player that's going to come in in the summer as well so it was just a natural parting I think it's more so uh, why did we not why did we buy Danny Ings but did we need to buy Danny Ings really for 30 million or whatever it was and put him on a big contract when when we did obviously when we sold Grealish it was probably a, not the best move because we already had Ollie Watkins <laughs> it was always a kind of a questionable one um on Archer and Duran, Duran is obviously here to stay. He's mm-hmm. the club signing and Emery likes him and we like him. He's clearly the future. He's impressed in three games and yeah, we like him a lot. Again, although saying that, he obviously still needs to develop and there's no guarantee we'll do that. But from what we've seen, it looks good. On Archer, <laughs> I'd love it to work because he's a local lad, he's a striker. He does the hardest thing in the game, which is score goals. He's got a great celebration as well. But when is he going to get his chance? Like, mm. my opinion, he he deserves to, but let's be real, he won't. Similar to the Matty Cash one earlier, do you think Archer will be here next season? In my opinion, I don't think he will, because what is the point in kind of stockpiling a 21-year-old when he's he can clearly score goals, at least in the championship, and who knows, if Borough go up, maybe they'd buy him, and that would probably solve the issue for him and for us if he wants to go there. But it's not similar to Davis because Davis was a very different player. But in terms of he left it too late to leave Villa, in my opinion. And for Archer, Mm -hmm. he doesn't want to stick around and keep doing low moves and keep doing low moves in the championship for another two or three years. If I was Archer, and uh, again, I'm a diehard Villa fan, but I would get out while I can to save, not to save my career, that sounds dramatic, but to make the most of my career. career. 
Yeah, because he's not going to get above Ollie Watkins. He just isn't. He, even if he scores goals from off the bench, he will. He won't start over Watkins. Can they not and start we'll, together? No, because then you've got a Duran. Why have we signed Duran? What would be the mm, point in that? Just in uh, Archer, plus the new forward who's going to be arriving in the summer, plus maybe a winger, plus you still have Leon Bailey, Emmy Buendia, who can play alongside. Uh, Watkins I just don't think there's space for Archer and I'd love to make space if I was the manager I would make space for him hmm. but w- w- you, it's, I just don't see it happening Emery clearly like when Gerard, um I almost thought he was kind of playing to the gallery when he kept him in the summer was it this summer? yeah again it feels <laughs> like ages ago that Gerard was here um, he scored a couple of goals in pre-season didn't he Archer and it was hmm. like oh we need to keep him around because he scores goals and I was like, well, yeah, that's fine. But where are you going to play him? We play one up front, mostly. I know we play two up front sometimes under Gerard, but mostly it was one. We have Watkins and we have Danny Ings, both players who Gerard liked. And then we have Archer in reserve and he'd come on to play against Forrest a couple of minutes and come on against West Ham for a couple of minutes. So he was never going to get the minutes. And now under Emery, although we're playing two up front, it doesn't really matter because we just bought in Duran. We're going to buy another striker. Plus, he likes to play with that almost sort of wide player alongside Watkins so I honestly don't see where Archer fits in that and again I'd love him to fit in but I just don't know where it would be and for the sake of his you know the next two or three years of his career I'd rather see him earn a move elsewhere and hey if he if he becomes the top player that we hope he can I'm sure he'd be one of the first clubs that he'd you know love to come back to so I just think for the sake of his own career he needs to make the right decision and I hope we allow him to as well. Just very quickly, you mentioned a couple of times about you know, we'll sign another striker in the summer. I think I agree, to be honest. But what if we don't? What if Emery trusts Watkins, Duran and Archer to be the three? I get the point, but I don't think he will. Like We know he's going to... He's already said it a few times that he wants one. And I get the point, Dan, but I just don't think... I can't imagine us not signing a striker. But if that is the case, then Archer, Duran... Then, Dan, I would keep Archer if we're not signing a striker. Because yeah. then you've got a case of Watkins Obviously, and Duran. Yeah. Duran would yeah. come out and Archer come in, you know. But I don't think that would be enough. I do think you need someone who you know is ready to complement Watkins because although goal scoring isn't necessarily an issue for us at the moment, next season you want to have as much firepower as you can get. So, yeah, you know, is Archer ready to play? Yes, he is. But then if you've got John Duran, who the club clearly not necessarily favour, but why would you spend nearly 20 million quid on him? Mm. They probably do. Then that's, you know, if we didn't have Duran, then Archer can you know, play in reserve. But we have to run and we're going to sign a striker. So, Well, in with a couple more. This one's for me and he sent a couple in, but I think we've answered a couple of his already in other people's questions. <laughs> the one that kind of, oh, well, we've talked about this a little bit, so we won't go on it for too long. He said, do you all hide behind your hands like me when we pass it around the back? Now, what do you think about playing around the back? Because if my dad's watching this, which he probably won't be because he's away at the moment, he would be saying, when we were talking about Martinez earlier about being good with his feet, he'd be saying, he doesn't need to be good with his feet, he needs to be good with his hands. He's a goalkeeper, keep the ball out of the net and give it to the players who can pass the ball. Which I kind of agree with to a certain extent, but football is changing. The moans and groans at Villa Park, I suppose, is a wider talking point here because playing at the back is, it seems, here to stay because if you want to get good at it, as we've said many times, you've got to keep doing it. I like it, I understand what it's done, it draws players in, allows you to break, etc. Easy peasy. But it does have those moments where you're going to make mistakes and I understand why people are watching it through their fingers or behind the sofa. But you've kind of just got to embrace it, haven't you? And go with the chaos a little bit. Yeah, I think that's the point and that is probably one reason why we're better away from home because there's less, let's say less pressure, but away from home where it feels like more, we feel a bit more compact, a bit more sort of, not switched on, but I guess it is switched on in a way because when we're at home, we kind of think, all right, we can ride that one tackle and get out of the break. Like against Leicester, I know you probably didn't watch it, Dan, but when Kamara, for example, took the ball in his box and he beat one player and he was like, oh, mm. and now dispatch, you know, get get rid. And he didn't. He kind of tried to do another one. I think away from home, he doesn't do that. So mm. a lot of the errors that we've done at home when playing out from the back are probably because we're at home. And I know Martinez did that one against Brighton, but that wasn't, that was just a bad judgment of pass to play to Louise. Um, then Donko mm-hmm. against Stevenage again, just a bad error. Like he wouldn't do that away from home. I think he just probably was too lax, too too comfortable. Kamara did it did two against Leicester. I uh, can't think of too many others. Probably have, so probably have made them though. Um, but yeah, the main point, I, I don't like the, I, I get the anxiety of Villa Park. I completely understand it, especially if we go one down. Mm. And because you know the mistakes that have happened, I think it's just something that we've got to get used to because it's not going to change. And when it does change, it'll only change for the better. We're not going to get worse at playing out from the back, are we? We're only going to improve. 
and for, for a season that we are literally playing for trying to get 10th because we haven't done it in over a decade, I think it's worth just persisting with up until now because next season that's hopefully when we're going to be see us, see us, sorry, you know, play effectively with potentially different players and players, you know, also the players that we have at the moment will be more sort of um, improved, I suppose, in that area. But yeah, for the next couple of months, we need to persist with it and let it happen. If mistakes are caused, then players will hopefully learn from that. And that's all we can do as fans because, say, it's not going to change. And um, yeah, hopefully next season it'll be uh, more or less tense, I suppose. Do you think 10th is the height of our ambition for the remainder of this season? Do you think that's all that we can do? Top top ten, tenth night. Yeah, I don't think we'll be getting European football because I don't know. Who I, we'll I, be. I agree, but you look at Fulham in sixth, thirty nine points, and Villa with thirty one points with a game in hand. I'm not yeah. saying that Villa are going to catch them and make up four places there, five places, and overtake all those. I mean, you've got Liverpool in there, Brighton, Chelsea, obviously above us. You know, tenth yeah, finishing I mean, tenth would would be I say an achievement. I don't even know if it is finishing tenth is fine. We, like yeah. you said, we've not done it in a decade. It's been a bit of a, a season of two halves, isn't it? To coin a football cliche, we've had a terrible start. We've got better. We've still had our moments, and we will continue to have our bad moments for the rest of the season as well. So finishing in the top half, you kind of would mark down to progress. But I almost also don't want to write off ninth, eighth, seventh with a very good end to the second half of the season, although probably unlikely. Yeah, and I think like, and obviously, there's a big argument that Liverpool and Chelsea won't be this bad next season either. Yeah, but then you know, will Brighton be this good, or will Fulham, Fulham be this good? So there's always ways of playing out. And I've always said, if we're going to get top six football, it'll be because we des- it'll be sorry, it'll be because we deserve it, and not because of the teams that play poorly. Do you know what I mean? Like when West Ham mm. got top six, when Wolves got top seven, when Leicester got top four, and things like that. There was no horrendously bad top six teams. They were just better than them. So if we're going to yeah. get there, it'll be because we're good enough. It won't be because we've just snuck in and all of a mm. sudden you know, a happy day. You take that though, wouldn't you? <laughs> Sneaking in, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the. But it's an, a, a long-term, sustainable top six plan that we have. Mm. We'll get there because we deserve to. So there's no, there's not a rush to do it. If that makes sense. Like if we did it, then great. Not too sure how the summer would play out, but we kind of trust the people in place and in, in management. Um, but yeah, the only other thing I would say is that even if we don't get top 10 and we finish 11th, because at the moment that probably seems most likely, I suppose, unless Brentford come down a little bit um, and we finish top 10, because I think that's the team that would get over and they would slip mm. down for getting. Um, but whether we finish 10th, 11th, 12th, I don't see how it would change when we, how it would change us, sorry, when we kick off on the first day of next season. Mm. I don't think it'll make any impact whatsoever. So I think just for the, just for the fun of getting top 10 and the kind of hoodoo of not finishing in, in the top 10, that would be the kind of, oh, that was nice to do. But then after a few days of the season ending, it'll be like, right, well, next season, what are we doing? So yeah. I don't think it's, it's just for the next <laughs> four or five months to keep us all sane and entertained. We want to win games, finish top 10. But ultimately, I know we've said it for a long time, but next season is the season. <laughs> and <laughs> we've done that a lot, but <laughs> now it really is because we have a top manager and hopefully the players to back it up as well. There is he faithful says, just a three word question. Favourite chocolate bar? Uh, Yorkie. Spot on. That's exactly what oh, I was going to say. And I thought that was going to be a bit controversial going with the Yorkie. I thought you'd say it was a bit boring, but just what's a solid, your, what's solid your chocolate. Yeah. Just like solid, like it's solid. I feel like it's substantial. Like oh, a yeah. Cadbury or something, it's a bit like thin and weak, but a Yorkie's yeah. like, I've got to bite this hard. Like it feels like, it feels like a meal in a chocolate bar, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't like. Um... Sounds sad. I don't like, like crumbs and stuff. And a York, you can kind of just, it's all very meat. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah, good. I don't see they I don't. But you can kind of just break it off and take your, each chunk. Yeah. Whereas all the chocolates are more, like, I don't like Twix and I don't like... Um, Twix is a biscuit like, more than a chocolate, yeah, I would say. Uh, yeah, you probably class it as that. But do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want them... Mm. Like, Yorkie for me, yeah. It's probably a bit boring because there's not much to it. But ah, Good though. Have you tried the orange one? No, I haven't. Oh, you'll like that. Trust me. If you like a Yorkie, you like an orange Yorkie. Yeah, I don't actually like like loads of chocolate. If that makes sense. Like, I'm not a massive fan. But if I had to pick a chocolate bar, I'd say Yorkie. Yeah, because yeah, you're a, a skinny, athletic gym freak, and look at me. <laughs> I've tried all the chocolates under the sun. Yeah. Um, final question from Holly. It's a two parter, in fact. Uh, first one I can take. What happened to the football manager streams? Appreciate you're all busy. Obviously, James was working for us at the time. He's now left. Me and Dan are very busy with different things, and it just kind of tapered off and you get you get stuck into the rhythm we've spoken about this john 
pre-match, post-match, pre-match, post-match, pre-match, post-match, you almost lose chance to do Q&As and phone-ins and things that we want to do, interviews. So doing something like Football Manager that is like a two, three-hour sit down in front of a computer and don't move. For me, with a newborn, it's very unlikely I'll get the chance to do that ever again, never mind any time soon. It'll be something we'd like to do. It's fun. It's something a little bit extra. But yeah, it's probably unlikely it's going to come back at this stage, unfortunately. And she ends her tweet with a second question. When is the next live event? We don't particularly have a, a date yet, but it's definitely something we want to do. I feel like we've probably spoken about this on the podcast after the last live event. That wouldn't be the last time we do it. I want to do one at the end of the season. It's like an end of season review. We do those at the end of every season anyway. We went to the Aston Social, didn't we, last year? It might have been Pat, though. Me, Pat, Ash and Matt. It might have been you, can't remember. And we always do them at the start of season as well as like a preview. So I'd like to do one at the end of this season, so late May or early June. And to be honest, if that goes okay, I'd like to do one for the start of next season as well. So sometime in August, a season preview, talk about the transfers we've made, the usual season predictions where we all make ourselves look silly. So ideally, an end of season one and one to start the next season, specific dates and locations and tickets and stuff, a long way away yet, but rest assured there will be another Clown Blue Live at the end of the season details to be confirmed in the next couple of months that's all for the questions though for, for this q a we'll try and do these more regularly as well as i mentioned at the start i've just moved house i just had a baby and i am trying to do more work related things so football manager probably won't be coming back because everything else is busy but we want to do more interviews where possible we want to go out and about and, and film some more kind of features q a's phone ins things like that that we've done before because we kind of got into a habit of doing a preview on a friday and a post-match show on a sunday or saturday and then nothing again until the following Friday. And it's this kind of routine of just preview, post-match preview. I want to kind of throw in the odd Q&A here and there. And you know, when we acquired that Portuguese club a couple of weeks ago, really that should have been a, a podcast to look at. What does that mean for Villa? Can we get a Portuguese expert to, to come and chat about it? When we signed Unai Emery, you've got Guillaume Balagay on it and got some information about that. I want to do more things like that. So stay subscribed and stay tuned to the Count Blue podcast for hopefully more content throughout the course of 2023. John, thanks for your time as always. Almost hit the hour mark, but just just under. I mean, we haven't done this one live, by the way, for people watching this. So uh, when I edit this down, it, when it's like 25 minutes, then we'll be going, almost an hour. Where did the rest of it go? But we we'll talked some nonsense, so we might have cut, I might have cut loads of it out. Uh, but John, thanks for your time as always. I can hear a baby crying, so apologies for that if anyone else can. So I better go, <laughs> go help deal with that. Uh, John, thank you as always. Thanks everyone for watching. Get involved in the comments down below. We'll be back on Friday with a preview for Crystal Palace and then Saturday for the post-match show. Um, so stay tuned and we'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa. Up the villa.